Welcome, my friends. I am so excited because today I get to talk about sampling. So traditionally, in an intro stat class, uh, you might talk about a number of different sampling methods, such as stratified sampling, cluster sampling, random sampling, all these different kinds of sampling techniques. But here, I'm only going to be focusing on two. I'm just going to be focusing on the random sample and the convenient sample. I feel like all the details of all the additional uh, sampling methods and all the intricacies about how they're slightly different from each other are not really that important for an intro stat class. I think what's really important is to just understand the main idea of why are, why are we sampling and what is a random sample and what are some things that we can do in order to get a representative sample. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's first talk about why we even sample in the first place. Now you may remember the distinction between a sample and a census. A census is when you gather data from every single member of your population of interest. So remember, you as a researcher are going to determine what your population is. The population is just the group of all individuals that you would like to study. So your population might be maybe all adults that are of a certain age, or maybe it is uh, you know, a certain type of animal, or maybe it is uh, students in a school or something like that, right? So whatever you're, you're trying to, to study, that's going to be your population. And a census would be gathering data from every single member of that population. But as we've said previously, populations are typically very, very large. They can sometimes contain thousands or even millions of individuals. So in most cases, it's going to be impossible or very, very difficult to gather a census. So in most cases, researchers are going to be settling for a sample, a subset of the population, and hoping that their sample is somehow representative of the population, which really just means it's the same as the population, just kind of a smaller group. So an example that we're going to kind of work with here is, let's say we want to know what percent of voters are going to vote for Ronald Crump in an upcoming election. So here we have uh, Ronald Crump over here on the bottom right, and let's say that he is running for president of the United States. And, you know, we're, we're like a, you know, a polling organization and we want to, you know, we want to know what percent of all the voters out there who are going to, you know, turn out for this upcoming election, what percent of those voters are going to vote for Ronald Crump, and we want to estimate that before the election actually happens, right? So our population in this case would be all voters, or all the people who eventually will come out and turn out for this election, right? And there's going to be a lot of voters, so it's going to be pretty difficult to track down all the voters and, you know, ask them who they're planning to vote for in this election, right? So tracking down every single voter and, and gathering that information, that would be a census, which I guess in a way is what happens on election day. Like on election day, all the voters come together and they, they cast their vote. And then we, we really have the census of all of them. But I guess the, the point here is we want to be able to predict what that outcome would be ahead of time. Can we know a month ahead of time kind of, you know, what's it, what's it looking like? Is it looking good for Ronald Crump or good for his opponent? Uh, we want to know that, right? So instead of taking a census, we're probably going to be taking some some sort of sample from the voter. So we're not going to have every single voter. We're going to have a sample of maybe a thousand voters or a couple thousand voters. And from that, we would hopefully be able to glean what percent uh, approximately are going to vote for Ronald Crump in this election. So the term that they typically use is we would say that we want that our sample to be representative of the population. And I think I used this term a second ago. Basically, all that means is um, it's going to be basically the same as the entire population, but a smaller version of that, right? So if there are a million voters in the entire population that are going to vote in this election, or maybe more than a million, and, uh, you know, uh, let's say 50% were going to vote for Ronald Crump, then we would also hope that 50% of the voters in our sample would vote for Ronald Crump. That's what it would mean to have a representative sample. So let's go ahead and consider a few different ways we could sample 100 voters. And for each of these different cases, we're going to think about whether or not the sample is going to accurately represent the population of all voters. So uh, method number one was would be maybe we could interview voters outside of a Ronald Crump rally. So we could just you know go right outside the, the rally and just grab 100 of these random people, and then we'll ask them who are they supporting in the election. Well, clearly, there's, there's, there's going to be an issue here. They're going to be much more likely to support Ronald Crump than his opponent, Mo Seiden. So if we interview people here, we're not going to get the same percentage in our sample that we would based on the entire population. That's what we mean by representative, right? We should have an equal chance to get a Ronald Crump supporter uh, in the sample that we would in the population of all voters. And that's certainly not going to be the case here. We're going to be much more likely to get the, uh, the supporters of Ronald in this, uh, in this method. So this is probably not the best idea. Well, then you say, well, maybe we should get a 
uh, maybe list of phone numbers and we can um, you know, call or text some individuals, some registered voters by the phone and ask them who they're supporting. And this might appear to be better and this de definitely does sound to be a better sampling method than the first one. But there can always be certain ways that uh, you know your, your sampling method uh, might kind of uh, skew your results that you might not be realizing. Like it could be the case that the Ronald Crump supporters just don't really answer phone calls from people that uh, they don't know, right? Well, I, I think that kind of applies to most of us, but it could be the case that a certain type of voter is both more likely to support uh, one candidate and at the same time, either more or less likely to uh, answer a phone call. So this this could, this could does sound better, but there could still be some issues here, right? And then also we might not get all of the, the people, you know, not everyone even has a phone, right? Uh, so some voters might not even respond to the phone mess messages and um, you know, some registered voters might not even turn out to vote, right? We might get some registered voters in this sample and they might not end up uh, even voting. So there could be a lot of issues um, to consider. So then maybe an alternative would be to interview registered voters by phone, right? So if we want to get a, you know, a representative sample of the people who are going to eventually vote, maybe we can interview people who are registered to vote and we can contact them by phone, right? And this definitely seems like a big improvement from our previous sampling method, but there could still be some possible issues with this, right? So some voters might not respond to phone messages or maybe some certain voters don't even have a phone. Or it could be the case that, um, you know, maybe uh, supporters of Ronald Crump are more or less likely than your average voter to respond to a phone message, right? So we may get an overrepresentation of a certain type of voter uh, due to this kind of method of sampling. Um, or maybe, you know, some of the registered voters might actually not even vote. So we may be interviewing some registered voters who might not even eventually turn out to vote. So there could still be some issues with this, but nevertheless, seems to be a big improvement from the very first method. Or maybe a, you know, a third uh, option here would be just like kind of a, uh, you know, a variety of different, uh, you know, techniques here. So maybe we uh, include some phone, some, you know, mail, some social media, and maybe some other different uh, methods to target uh, a number of different voters, right? So certainly we would be getting closer to a representative sample, but you can start to see here by, you know, um, you know, all the things that we considered with just these, you know, just trying to get a simple sample of 100 voters, how difficult it can really be to get a representative sample. So the ideal case, and sometimes called the gold standard, would be what is called a random sample, sometimes called a simple random sample. And really all that means is there is an equal chance to choose any member of your population in your sample. And that applies to every single member uh, that you choose. So for example, uh, let's say there are a million individuals in your population of interest, right? And you're going to sample the first person. Well. All of the one million individuals should have a one out of a million chance to be chosen as the first person from the sample. And then the second person that you choose uh, should still be a one out of a million chance to choose any of those individuals in the sample for the second person or the third person or the fourth person. So every single person you choose should have a one in one million chance uh, to be sampled. Uh, technically, if you want to be technical here, that does mean you could have uh, repeats, but generally that doesn't happen because, you know, the populations are large. What's the chance you're really going to choose the same person twice, right? pretty low. So uh, what I want you to have in your head for random sample, random sample just means out of everyone in the population, there's an equal chance to choose anyone. And you would expect that a random sample would probably be representative, right? Representative means like, you know, if 50% of people were going to support uh, Ronald Crump in the election or vote for Ronald Crump, then based on our sample, we would also get 50%. So random samples are expected to be representative or close to representative, but uh, because they are random, they could be, you know, a little bit off, a little bit above or below uh, that actual value, but nevertheless, uh, since it is random, this is kind of the gold standard. This is what we would like to have in every case. But we're not always going to have that case. Uh, in many cases, it's going to be unrealistic to get a random sample. It's very difficult to really even know where all those individuals are or how to, how to con contact every single person in the population. So in many cases, you might have some sort of convenience sample. And convenience sample just says, well, you know, don't really go out there and put all this effort forward to try to get an equal chance to choose everyone uh, to get a random sample. Just use the data that's readily available or easy to obtain. And sometimes that can be sufficient. So convenience samples are probably not going to be random, right? Probably not going to have an equal chance to choose anyone in your population. But depending on the variable that you've collected, it might still be representative. I'm gonna give you two examples here. One where we have a convenience sample that is representative of the population, or most likely is, and one example where it is not. So here's example number one. Let's say our population of interest is all 
Grand Rapids Community College students. So we we want to, you know, for our sample, we, to have a representative sample, we would want to uh, have, you know, for whatever variable we're going to collect, which in this case is going to be number of pets owned, we would want that from our sample, however many pets were owned on average from our sample should also apply to the population. And let's say that our sample is 10 calculus students. So maybe this is a teacher who's uh, conducting this sample, and it's con the most convenient thing for him to do would be to just sample students from his own class, and he teaches calculus, right? And you would probably say, you'd probably, you know, think about this for a second and say, you know, is this going to be a representative sample? Well, first of all, it's not a random sample, definitely not a random sample, because uh, we're only choosing students in a particular class, right, calculus, right? So we're not going to get students who are not in a calculus class. But is that really an issue for this variable? Uh, really, the question you got to ask yourself is, are students in a calculus class more or less likely to own pets than your typical GRCC student? And probably your answer to that question is no, right? So this is probably going to be a representative sample uh, because uh, being a calculus student or being any you know other type of student, that's probably not going to influence how many pets you own. Um, if you're a calculus student or if you're a not a calculus student, you're probably just as likely to own so many pets as any random student in the college. So even though this is not a random sample, we're only selecting a certain type of student, the way that we bias the results probably does not matter for this variable of pet zone. So therefore, we would say this is probably still going to be a representative sample. On the other hand, let's say that we have the, the same population of all GRCC students, but now the variable we're going to collect is the, the student's major, right? So now we're going to have a problem. If we use the exact same sample, if we still sample calculus students and we collect their major, well, this is going to be skewed towards the majors that people who take calculus have, right? So this is going to be skewed towards like math majors or engineering majors or statistics majors or anything like that, right? So this is probably not going to be a representative sample for this variable. So here you can see in two different, um, the, the exact same uh, population, the exact same sample, but depending on the variable, we may or may not have a representative sample, right? If we have a, a variable like number of pet zone, well, it probably doesn't matter if they're a calc student or not, right? But if we're trying to collect uh, their class major, well, then that's probably going to make a difference, right? Uh, calculus students are going to be more likely to have a certain major. So really the question you always have to ask yourself with convenient samples is, first of all, how has my convenient sample biased my results? In this case, it's biased it towards uh, calculus students. And then you have to ask yourself, does the way that it's biased the results make any difference for the variable I've collected? And if my variable is pet zone, probably not. If my variable is class major, then definitely. Okay, so here is uh, one for you to try. Uh, so uh, I want you to go ahead and decide if each situation below represents a random or a convenience sample. Uh, for a convenience sample, we have kind of those two different cases. Sometimes the convenience sample could be representative of the population, and sometimes it might not. So uh, make that determination for each of these. So we kind of have three choices here, either random, convenience and representative, or convenience and not representative. So here are the, the three different uh, questions here. So I'll give you a minute to kind of uh, think about these and try these out, and then I will discuss the first two. And if you are a student in one of my classes, you'll have to submit an answer for the last one. All right, so hopefully you've given these a shot, and I'm going to go through the first two right now. So the first one says, a hospital has records of patients kept in folders alphabetized by last name. A nurse pulls out the first 50 folders to determine what proportion have high blood pressure. So first of all, we do not have a random sample. We don't have an equal chance to choose any of the patients at the hospital since we're choosing the first 50 in the folder, and the folder is alphabetized by last name. So it's going to be some sort of convenient sample. So if it's a convenient sample, the next question we have to ask is, how have we biased the results? Well, in this case, we've biased the results towards individuals who are earlier in the alphabet, right? Earlier in terms of their last name. So we're going to get people who, whose last name probably end with a, or start with A or maybe B. Now, the question is, is that going to have any effect on, uh, or does that matter for the variable of proportion of uh, individuals who have high, high blood pressure? Or in other words, do people who are earlier in the, in the alphabet have uh, you know, different blood pressure than the average uh, patient in this hospital? And probably the answer is going to be no, right? We're probably going to have uh, just as many people with high blood pressure from our sample that we would have from a random sample. Uh, so for that reason, I'm going to say this is probably a convenient sample that would be representative of the population. Question two says, a biology professor uses her class of 50 master's level biology majors to determine if memory and college students 
is affected by background noise levels. So again, this is going to be a convenient sample because we're not selecting from every individual in the college, I, I guess if we assume that was the population, um, all students at the college, we're only stu uh, selecting students in a particular class, right? These master's level biology majors in this, student, uh, this uh, professor's class. So it's going to be a convenient sample. And we biased this specifically towards master's level biology majors. And I would probably wager for the variable of, you know, uh, their memory retention uh, based on background noise levels, they're probably not going to be a representative uh, sample, right? If they're master's level students, they're probably going to have maybe better study or, um, you know, like uh, focus skills than your average student, right? So these students are probably going to do better maybe on this memory test than your average student. So for that reason, we would say this is a convenient sample that is not representative of the sample or of the population. All right, we have one more thing to talk about as it relates to samples, which is the difference between sampling error and non-sampling error. So even if we have a random sample, meaning an equal chance to choose anyone in the population, it's still possible that our sample results do not represent the population due to chance. So it could be the case that, uh, you know, just due to chance, we get more Ronald Crump supporters uh, percentage-wise than there actually are in the entire population, right? So just because we have a random sample doesn't guarantee that our results are going to be perfectly representative. So here's an example of that. Let's say that I take a random sample of 100 GRCC students and I find the mean age to be 25. But we're able to check the student records and those show that the true mean age based on all of these students in the college is actually only 24, right? So we were off by a little bit. We, uh, we got a mean of 25 from our sample, our random sample, but the true value was actually 24, right? Uh, so this is what we would call sampling error. So here is a little bit of a review for you. So uh, could you uh, remember uh, the symbols that we use to represent uh, some of these values? So this is a sample, this 25 that we had here. Had here. This is the sample based. So here's a little bit of a review for you. Uh, you may remember that we use different symbols to represent the mean based on if it was calculated on a sample or the entire population. So right here, this 25 was a sample mean. So you, can you remember the symbol that we use to represent the sample mean? Well, hopefully you remember that as X bar. So the proper symbol to represent this would be X bar. And we would say this is a statistic because this is a value that is calculated based on a sample. Statistics are based on samples, and this is the sample mean x bar. And then we have the 24, which is the population mean, right? This is the mean based on all of the students. So do you remember what symbol that we use for the population mean? Well, the proper symbol for the population mean is the Greek letter mu. And we say that this is a parameter because it's based on everyone in the entire population. So now you can kind of see the use for these uh, different symbols and why we might use different symbols to represent a sample mean and a population mean. In this case, our sample mean was 25, but the true population mean based on everyone is actually 24. So that basically means that our error, our sampling error is one. We were off by one, right? We took a random sample, we did everything right, but we were still off by you know one unit and that is what we call sampling error. So in this example, the sample statistic of X bar is one off from the population parameter of mu, right? And this is what we call sampling error. So the sampling error is the amount that a statistic, a sample statistic differs from a population parameter when a random sample is taken. So that's kind of a, a key thing here is this does assume a random sample. So if you take a random sample and uh, your value is a little bit off from the population parameter, then we would say that uh, sampling error has occurred. And you can always expect that you can have some amount of sampling error. Of course, uh, one way that you could uh, decrease that sampling error would be to increase your sample size. So the larger your sample size is, uh, the smaller this value you can expect it to be. Now, this is not the only source of quote unquote error. There could be some additional errors if you don't have a random sample. So if you don't have a random sample or you have some kind of other mistake or some kind of biased sampling method, then you're exposing yourself to some additional type of error. This is what we call non-sampling error, right? So non-sampling error is some additional error present in the event that a random sample is not taken which could include uh, some kind of bias results like a convenient sample. It would also include other things like maybe you made some kind of mistake in your data collection. Maybe uh, you had some kind of like leading wording uh, within your survey question that kind of got people to say a certain, uh, certain answer. So um, this would all be under the umbrella of non-sampling error, right? So sampling error is the error that remains even when you have a random sample. So if you have a random sample and you're still off, that's what we call sampling error. 
you could additionally have non-sampling error if you had some kind of uh, mistake or some kind of biased uh, sampling method. And uh, a lot of the statistical techniques that we'll talk about in the future, like confidence intervals and hypothesis tests, oftentimes assume that we have eliminated the non-sampling error. They assume that we've gotten as close to uh, as we can to only having sampling error, meaning we have a random sample or very close to it, right? And that's what I'm saying right here. Many statistical procedures assume that a random sample has been taken. All right, so that finishes this video related to sampling. So hopefully you found it helpful. Farewell, my friends, and until next time.